video, I'm going to briefly review some of the major parts of the central nervous system, focusing on those that are going to be relevant to our discussion of CNS drugs. Now, first and foremost, remember that in order for the brain to function, it has to have sugar and it has to have a high enough blood pressure every second of every day. It only takes one time of having low blood pressure or low blood sugar, and then you pass out and lions eat you. That's no good. So most of the systems in your body work to increase blood pressure and increase blood sugar. We'll come back to this when we study the cardiovascular and endocrine drugs. All right, as for CNS anatomy, we humans are privileged enough to have a nice big portion of the what are called higher order or thinking parts of the brain called the cerebrum. The cerebrum surrounds a more primitive part of the brain called the diencephalon, and that surrounds the most primitive part of the brain, which just sort of keeps you alive. That's the brain stem. Sitting behind the brain is the cerebellum, and all of this sits on top of the spinal cord, which along with 12 cranial nerves relays information to the rest of the body. Now let's start with the cerebrum. Now there's a cerebral cortex and a cerebral medulla. In anatomy, the word cortex corresponds to the chocolatey outside and the medulla refers always to the insides, which in the case of a Reese's peanut butter cup is made of peanut butter. Similarly, in the cerebrum, the cortex surrounds the medulla. The cortex is the gray matter and is made up mostly of cell bodies of the brain cells. And the cerebral medulla is uh, all the connections between those cells. The cerebrum contains areas important for voluntary actions such as thinking, speaking, comprehension, reading, writing, mathematics, memory, intelligence, personality. That is all the cool stuff that humans are really good at uh, as compared to, say, rats. This is my friend Schmo, the executioner. Now, he's very clever. He knows a lot of tricks, uh, but he's complete rubbish at differential equations. And I think you can see there's definitely a difference in the size of our brains. And uh, he's quite, got quite a lot more... Um, midbrain and brainstem rather than cerebrum. The cerebrum consists of four main lobes. Uh, my personal favorite, of course, is the occipital lobe, which is important for vision, but there are also the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. Very generally speaking, the frontal lobe is pretty good at problem solving. Parietal lobe is good for touch and vibration. The temporal lobe is good at language and memory. Uh, they're all important for movement, but let's be honest, it is not that simple. In the olden days, uh, portions of the brain were roughly classified by their physical and anatomical structures. But nowadays we have a much better feeling for the functional parts of the brain uh, because of tools that we have like you know, functional imaging like PET scans. So now we can divide structures by function rather than just the way they look on a cadaver. Now before we go on, I just want to point out two big functional structures that are partially in the cerebrum and partially deeper down. There's the basal ganglia, which coordinates gross muscle movements, some unconscious movements, starting and stopping movements, uh, and muscle tone. We're going to talk about the basal ganglia with specific reference to Parkinson's disease and the side effects of some of the anti-dopamine drugs, particularly those used for psychosis. Next, I want to mention the limbic system, which regulates emotional and behavioral response to stress and threats to survival. So that's things like fear, rage, anxiety, and pleasure. And uh, the limbic system is thought to be related to addictive behavior. Remember that addiction is different from dependence when it comes to drugs. Next, we've got the diencephalon, and within that we have the pineal gland. The pineal gland is responsible for circadian rhythms, which, are, which has to do with our 24 almost 24 hour internal clock. And the pineal gland secretes melatonin to help you regulate your sleep cycles. It's pretty well known that disruption of sleep usually worsens any kind of condition having to do with the brain. Next up in the diencephalon, we have the hypothalamus, which is a huge deal. It's a heavy hitter in the body. It controls and regulates uh, not only the autonomic nervous system and therefore the blood pressure and the heart rate, but it also has important part to play in the regulation of mood, appetite, body temperature, the pH and osmolarity of your blood, uh, and it helps to keep you awake. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on with the hypothalamus. Now, when I went to medical school in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the Part of the hypothalamus that produces hormones like ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, uh, which is important for regulation of blood volume, and oxytocin, that part of the hypothalamus was called the posterior pituitary, but it's been since sort of turned into part of the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus also regulates the pituitary gland, which is going to be a big deal when we talk about endocrine drugs. Uh, next up in the diencephalon is the thalamus. Oh, wait, I don't care about the thalamus. Let's move on. Now we're getting to the brainstem, which sits sort of on the top of the spinal cord. And again, because of its position, part of the function of the brainstem is going to just be relaying information between the spinal cord and the other parts of the brain and the cerebellum, et cetera, et cetera. The brainstem is also where most of the cranial nerves originate. Now there's something that runs throughout the brainstem called the reticular formation, and it has a lot of different functions, but I want to point out the reticular activating system or the RAS. That is 
part of the reticular formation, but the reticular activating system is a series of fibers that are either activating or inhibitory, and they regulate how awake you are. So if there's loud music and bright colors and people around you are screaming and firing off weapons, the RAS keeps you awake so that you can deal with the excitement. In contrast, when you are in a dark, quiet room and someone is droning on and on about brain anatomy, the RAS is inhibited and you fall asleep. Pharmacologically speaking, the RAS is inhibited by the CNS depressants like alcohol, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and it's excited by stimulants like amphetamines and caffeine. And we're going to come back to all those drugs in the next lecture. Now, all three of the main structures in the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, are crucial to numerous physiologic systems. And I don't want to get into all that. Let's just say that the hypothalamus is a heavy hitter and the brainstem is also crucial to keeping oxygenated blood and sugar coming to our brain so we don't pass out and you know what. Uh, first, the midbrain, uh, it has a lot of different functions. I like the ones where when somebody scares you, you jump away and look at what was scaring you. And that's actually a reflex. So when you see people getting scared on TV and everyone laughs, they're just displaying their regular normal brain function. It's not really that funny. More immediately relevant to this, to this farm class is the substantia nigra. This is one of many centers important in controlling movements, but is particularly critical in Parkinson's disease. That pons, it helps your medulla with breathing. It helps you remember not to urinate on yourself. But I want to get to the best part, which is, of course, the medulla oblongata, my favorite part of the brain. Just the name is beautiful. It sounds like the name of a beautiful woman. Anyway, the medulla does a lot of things, including regulating the RAS and therefore regulating how awake you are. Uh, there's also cardiovascular centers in the medulla oblongata, which keep your heart beating and work on your blood vessel constriction and dilation. There's a breathing center, which is huge in terms of uh, drug toxicity. There's also a vomiting center and what's called the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which we'll get back to when we talk about GI drugs. Other things that the medulla oblongata controls are the larynx, your tongue, swallowing, coughing, sneezing, hiccups, and of course you've got all those cranial nerves, uh, part of 7 and 8, and then you got 9, 10, 11, 12. The medulla oblongata becomes a big deal in this class because of what's called medullary depression. That's depression of the medulla is called medullary depression. So medullary depression is something that causes death in cases of overdose of CNS depressants like alcohol, opiates, or any drugs that mimic the action of GABA like benzodiazepines or barbiturates or even anesthetics. And the result of that is that you stop breathing and stop and your heart stops beating, which is not good for you. All right, lastly, we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum regulates posture and balance. Cerebellum is really important for coordinating very complex movements. It compares what movement your brain was intending to do with what actually happened. Uh, and that has to do with proprioception, which is your body's ability to know where it is in space at any time. I think a great example of how your cerebellum works and how it helps you is the task of carrying a pitcher of water downstairs without spilling it. Now, again, remember that regulation of movement is incredibly complicated with components of the motor cortex of the cerebrum, other parts of your cerebrum, the basal ganglia, thalamus, brainstem, cerebellum, all sorts of places. And because of that, a very small lesion somewhere in your brain will produce noticeable movement problems. And that's actually very helpful in diagnosis of disease or injury. All right, next thing to review will be neurotransmitters. And then we're going to get into talking about CNS drugs. Woohoo! Oh.